Hi everyone, my name is Jolie McCrary and this particular video is for AP Psychology students. It is part two of the biological basis of behavior unit and focuses on the nervous system and neural communication. So to start, let's put this video in context. You can see here the outline of the College Board's Unit 1 topics. This particular video falls under 1.2 and 1.3 and covers the overview of the nervous system, the neuron, and neural firing. After watching this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. Believe it or not, by the end of the video, you will also be able to define all of these essential concepts from part two. So as you already know from unit zero, psychologists have different areas of focus that inform their perspective on the science of psychology. And one of those is the biological perspective. And we will take a biological approach for the rest of this unit, working to understand the role of our brains and our bodies in our behaviors and our thought processes. So let's start by defining the nervous system. The nervous system is a communication network in the body. It is very fast and it uses a network of nerves that stretch from the brain out to all parts of our body. The nervous system uses an electrochemical process of electrical impulses and chemical neurotransmitters to help communicate messages from the brain to the body and vice versa. The nervous system is broken up into two subsystems, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal column and the peripheral nervous system consists of the nerves that branch out from the spinal cord all the way out to the ends of our body. So throughout this presentation, I will include the blue text boxes from the College Board CED so AP Psychology students can know exactly what's expected from them regarding each of the topics. So you can see here that students should be able to explain the subsystem of the nervous system, the different subsets, and I think this diagram is a great visual of that. And as I mentioned earlier, the peripheral nervous system contains the nerves that branch out from the spinal column and stretch throughout the entire body. These types of messages can be autonomic or somatic. The somatic nervous system is carrying messages um, to our skeletal muscles, and these are voluntary messages. You have conscious awareness and you have control over these messages, whereas the autonomic nervous system is carrying messages that you're not consciously in control of. These are involuntary functions, things like your digestion, your heartbeat, perspiration, and the autonomic nervous system can be divided into two more subsets and students need to be keenly aware of these two, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And the reason why these are very important is because there will be topics that we learn about later in the school year, things like stress and anxiety that are related back to our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And those biological functions of stress and anxiety can be explained through these nervous systems. So to, to finish, the sympathetic nervous system is the messages that are sent that you are not in control of, that are increasing your body functions, they are speeding up your heart rate and your breathing and perspiration, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is calming or slowing down those um, functions. That's slowing your heart rate, slowing and calming down your breathing and your respiration. Um, these are things that you have uh, no control over and are involuntary in a part of the peripheral and autonomic nervous system. So as we continue on through this presentation, we will just continue to break down the nervous system into smaller and smaller parts. So far, I've mentioned that the nervous system consists of the brain, the spinal cord, and then the nerves. And we've talked about the different subsets. Now, within all of our nerves are neurons. And neurons are the smallest cells that are making up our nervous system. They're the smallest unit. There are three different types. There are the sensory neurons that are carrying messages from the body's tissues and sensory receptors inward toward the spinal column and brain. There are interneurons that can be found in the spinal column and in the brain, and these neurons are used to communicate and process information. There are also motor neurons that are taking messages away from the spinal column and the brain out to the skeletal muscles.
So as we're learning about the pathway from sensory neurons to interneurons and out to motor neurons, it's important that you know something called the reflex arc. And the reflex arc is a situation where a message will go from the sensory neurons to the interneurons in the spinal column and not go all the way up to the brain, but will loop right back out to the motor neurons. And this is called the reflex arc. Reflexes are quick and voluntary motor movements that are ingrained in our biological systems. They're neural pathways that are governed by the spinal column, and it's a simple circuit that passes from the sensory nerves to the interneurons in the spinal column, and it goes straight back out to the motor nerves without going upward to the brain to be processed. And this also happens whenever you have a pain reflex. So if you touch something hot, the sensory neurons pick that up, send it to the interneurons in the spine, and it loops right back out to the motor neurons with a response that's almost instantaneous that pulls your hand away from that harmful stimulus. And this is referred to as the reflex arc. Now, surrounding the neurons and the nervous system are glial cells, and neurons rely on glial cells for nourishment and insulation. Similar to how queen bees are depending on their worker bees, glial cells are providing the nutrients, the insulation, um, they're helping guide neural connections and cleaning up waste after neurons send messages to one another. So at this point, we are going to go into depth about neural transmission. And neural transmission is more simply neural communication. How do those small units, those neurons, communicate with one another to send messages through the nervous system? And this is done through a, an electrochemical process, through electrical impulses, and chemical messengers. Now, neurons, they differ slightly in their like shape and size, but they're all variations of the same theme. They have a cell body which contains the nucleus and then they have fibers that surround them called dendrites and dendrites are receiving the stimulation or the message from previous neurons. Now then from the cell body there's a long extension or this long fiber that stretches out called an axon and the axon extends away from the cell body and you can see in this particular image an, an electrical impulse is shooting through that axon. The axon then ends with axon terminals. Sometimes they're called terminal branches or terminal buttons, and that is the end of the neuron. The axon is then encased in a fatty tissue called myelin or myelin sheath, and this acts as an insulator that ensures the speed of the mes message. Axon terminals, you can see there are the departure point from that particular neuron where the message then passes from one to the next. Now in this image, you can see two neurons. The first shows only the end. You can see the axon and the axon terminals where the second shows the full body of the neuron. And in this section, I'll explain how neurons pass messages from one to the next. Neural transmission begins with a neuron receiving stimulation or a signal from a previous neuron at the receptor sites on the dendrites. The dendrites are allowing for small ions to enter the cell body or the soma, which this starts to begin to charge the neuron. When the charge is strong enough to send an electrical impulse down the axon, we say it's reached a threshold. When the threshold is reached, a firing impulse shoots down the axon, and this is called action potential. It's important to know that when that threshold, that charge has reached the threshold, the action potential or the electrical impulse will fire down the axon with the same intensity every time. This is called the all or nothing or all or none principle. You can think of it like setting off a mouse trap. Once it's triggered, it will fire with full strength every single time. Once the action potential reaches the axon terminals, it triggers a release of chemicals out of the axon terminals into this gap between the two neurons called the synapse. And those little chemicals jump across the synapse. The chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And then they go into the receptor sites of the neighboring neuron. So let's get more specific on how action potential or the electrical impulse works. So as I mentioned, 
Action potential is the electrical impulse that fires through the neuron when the threshold is reached and it will fire with the same intensity every time. But how exactly does this occur? And that can be explained through depolarization. So to start, I want students, especially those who have studied neuroscience more in depth, to know that the College Board is not necessarily concerned with students understanding the sodium potassium pump, if you're familiar with that. But the College Board wants AP Psychology students to understand the function of the process of neural transmission more on a um, descriptive level and not necessarily so much like a molecular or chemical level. So students should be able to explain the stages of the resting period, depolarization, and the refractory period, which I'll explain here. So when a neuron is not passing a message through its body, when it is at rest, the fluid inside is negatively charged. So that is its neutral or resting state. We call this the resting period or the resting potential. The fluid outside is mostly positive and when the neurotransmitters are jumping across the synapse and binding at the receptor sites of the dendrites, a positive ion start to enter the soma or the cell body and this starts to charge the cell body and this is going to get to a point where we say it's reached the threshold the amount that's needed to fire an electrical impulse and it will cause a domino effect down the axon the first section of the axon will open its gates and it allows positive charges to enter the axon and negative charges to rush out. And this propels the action potential or the electrical impulse to fire down the axon and it actually changes the charge. The axon used to be negative, the positive charges rush in and it changes its charge, which is causing that domino effect or electrical impulse to shoot down. We call this depolarization. Now to send a new message, the neuron has to repolarize back to its neutral negative state. And this happens so quickly, just as quickly as the negative charges rush out, they rush back in to reset itself. And this recharging period is called the refractory period. And this happens just as quickly as the firing process occurred. And once it has recharged or the refractory period has occurred and it is back to its neutral neutral resting state, we say it is now back at the resting period. So far, I've focused on the electrical part of the communication system and the nervous system, but now I'll focus in on the chemical component of this. So you can see we are at the junction between two neurons, which is called the synapse. It's a little gap between the axon terminals of the first neuron and the dendrites of the following, the second neuron. And I like how neuroscientist Solomon Snyder describes neural transmission he explains it as neurons talking to each other at their synapses. So when that action potential that I described earlier reaches the axon terminals, it triggers the release of chemicals, they're called neurotransmitters, into the synapse or the synaptic gap. And those neurotransmitters then uh, get into those receptor sites, they say it's so perfect, it's like a key in a lock. The neurotransmitters fit into those receptor sites so perfectly. Now this happens very, very quickly. And once they are at the receptor sites, that's when it allows the charges to seep in and to start charging the soma. Now, one thing that it's important to know is that some neurotransmitters excite the message where some inhibit the message. And we'll learn a little bit more more in the next video about the specific types of neurotransmitters and the types of messages that they send. So this is the last step in the process. It's called reuptake. Here you can see the release of those neurotransmitters into the synapse. You can see that they are binding at the receptor sites of the next neuron. And after the message is sent into this neighboring neuron, those neurotransmitters are then reabsorbed into the original sending neuron through a process called reuptake. It allows them to be reused for future messages and any remaining neurotransmitters in the synapse are then cleaned up by glial cells or broken down by enzymes.
So finally, it's important that you know about two disruptions that can happen in the neural communication process, and they are caused by the autoimmune disorders, multiple sclerosis or MS, and myasthenia gravis or MG. And these are disorders that impact our muscular control and reaction time, and they're directly related to these dysfunctions in neural transmission. Multiple sclerosis or MS is caused by the deterioration of the myelin sheath, that fatty tissue that insulates the axon, and the deterioration of the myelin sheath can lead to the slowing of the messages from the brain to the muscles. And myasthenia gravis produces antibodies that block or destroy those receptor sites on the dendrites, specifically the, the receptor sites that receive a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And you will learn in the next video that acetylcholine is responsible for messages about movement. And these are the two disorders that cause disruption to the neural communication process. So let's do a few short review questions to close out this video. Remember, as we've done in previous videos, I'll read the questions aloud and you'll need to pause to determine the answer. The correct answers will be shown on the last slide at the end of the video. Question number one says, which division of the nervous system calms a person down once a stressful event has passed? Question number two says, Thomas is walking down his favorite street in town. Which division of the nervous system enables him to move muscles necessary to do this? Question number three says, if Drew's motor neurons were impaired, he would experience a disruption in the ability to... Question number four says, what is the purpose of the myelin sheath? And question number five says, what does the figure below best illustrate? So this concludes part two, the nervous system and neural communication. If you'd like to check the answers to those multiple choice questions, you can see them below. Also be sure that you can answer the following essential questions and key concepts.